Hey everybody, it's your collector dude. I think I go do a quick 15 minute video of the, on the second part for the art of George Perez. This is an awesome book. As soon as I saw it, I had to grab it. Every time he comes out with different books, I like to grab them, um, pick them up. I don't have all of them, but when I saw this one, I said I'm gonna get this one. So, but I st started on it already. So um, this will be part two of the book, so you can see the pages and everything. Check out the artwork, how awesome it is everything so you see just see the um, early stuff that he did and his action and stuff like that there's creatures on the loose number 33 page 10 ink by Klaus Jansen 1975 it's like wow we got some more man wolf over here ink by Bob McLeod and Terry Austin 1978. And page 15, inked by Ricardo Villamonte, 1978. And he said, I challenged myself to get better, and that was more important than any outside opinion would have been. Even when I was doing fanzine work, I felt certain perfectionist attitude. I felt a certain perfectionist attitude. I had no artistic training, so my expertise was limited to Neil. But I had a certain artistic hubris even then. I would sometimes confront Pat and Jim and tell them that what they were doing wrong and how they could do it better. I had to prove that I could do it better. So even then I was competing with myself as well as the other fanzine artist. And even then I tried to do everything. For example, my death squad story. I penciled, inked, lettered. I did it all. Even though I knew nothing about lettering or inking back then. Sure, it was crude amateurish but it was printed that hooked me I love seeing my work in print and even then I knew that I wanted to become a pro that's cool I did some of that myself when I made some of my old comic books myself I lettered inked penciled and everything penciled and put it all together layout cool it's Deadly Hands of Kung Fu number 30. And this one's Deadly Hands of Kung Fu number 30 and page 9. Wow. You got Deadly Hands of Kung Fu, page 10. And number uh, fi page 15 of it. And we get page 16. That's a cool page. Look at that. I love when they do the big head like that and then they have the memory in there. And I'm not sure. I guess they might have done it like this, like a wash type, and then they put color into it. That's really cool. I have to check these out. Fanzines also mark the first time I experienced drawing with a deadline. That's another problem with self publication whether printed or online. A lot of people don't know how to work on a deadline. They can show the finished work, and it may look great, but it doesn't demonstrate that they can meet a deadline. You don't know how long they worked on the story you see there. If you want to get your foot into the professional workplace, you have to show that you can do quality work and that you can do it on a schedule. Editors need to know that. They have to fill a book every month, and they don't want new artists who can't turn out the work. Once you're in the door and you build a reputation, then you can slow down a bit. But you have to prove yourself first. Thankfully, most editors and most fans are aware that I don't work that quickly as I did back in those early days. But I proved that I could produce a book that was worth it to them. That was worth the wait. And for many, many years, I turned out a book or more every month without fail. Cool. I used to call him like the pace setter. Now he just did his work. And then there's books out called Pace Setter by an independent guy. Um, I got a bunch of those and I got them signed by him. He did interviews and they did artwork in them as well. They're like little mat fanzines or like little um, comic book sized books that they did with George Perez and everything. Very cool. Logan's Run, page one, and Logan's Run two through five. Those would be cool to find. I'm not sure if those are going for anything or not. I have to check. 
I remember this movie. It was really good. Kind of eerie. I was working very fast in the beginning and I began to fall into familiar layout patterns, a sort of storytelling shorthand. There was one point where I realized I had copied a layout for one section of a story from another book that I had just drawn, and I realized I was never going to grow as an artist if I didn't slow down and put more time into it. The book where I began to take more time and really focus on my storytelling and design was Logan's Run, where I was trying to capture the essence of a movie in its art direction and its design. That got me addi addicted to that sort of visual design. A well-designed page made my art look better, and I could outdo the movies that inspired me. In Logan's Run, for instance, I could make the story even more dynamic visually because I could do things that they couldn't do in the movies. It didn't have to, I didn't have to worry about budgets, about injuring the stuntmen, about creating special effects that no effects artist could create. For whatever reason, that sort of design and storytelling was the most natural thing in the world for me. Hmm. Really cool artwork seeing his early stuff. Really cool. Inhumans 3 and 4. I had to learn a lot very quickly. That was one of the things I did enjoy, though. Taking a writer's idea and turning it into finished art. Since I came into plotting much later, I never told the writer what to put into a story. I had to learn how to draw what they wrote. And that put the burden on me. The more I cursed your name <laughs> when I drew your script, the more likely it is that you pushed me into drawing something I hadn't drawn before. And I learned a lot from that. I remember doing I getting uh, scripts from different people and... Uh drawing stories, but uh, my friend uh, Chris and I, we did a lot of stuff together on certain books that we have. Here we go, Fantastic Four 164. Fantastic Four 164. Again, it's page 11 up top and page 6 here. Really cool detail. And this is page uh, 18. Wow. Ink by Joe Sennett. One of the greatest compliments ever given to me from Ross Andrew came from Ross Andrew, a great artist and a master storyteller. He called me a natural. It turned out he was a big sucker for references too, but you never realized that when you were looking at his work because he was so skilled at incorporating those in references into his work in his own style. That's what I wanted to do. I didn't want my references to look out of place in the story. In 1975 to 1976, my work began to take on more elements of what a fan would think of as an archetypal Perez. Larger scope, grander in scale. A lot of that wasn't necessarily a conscious development of my style, but was the influence of artists who had preceded me, along with a genuine love of cinema. I always approached comic book art as if I was storyboarding a silent movie. So I had to express what everyone was doing and what they were feeling through facial features and body language and camera positioning. I wanted to do so much with the art that the words enhanced the story but were never forced to explain what the heck was going on. If I, didn't, if I don't communicate the story visually, then I'm failing as a comic book artist. I had to do that too. I had to learn how to draw and try to figure it out. Uh, without the words in there, so you could look at it and go, what the, what's that, what world's going on here? You didn't need the words for it. So he's right, he's really cool. And so I, I, I learned from him and Jack Kirby and all these guys, Neil Adams, uh, all this stuff, it was really cool. John Romita. This is Fantastic Four 178, page three and page 19. You see the detail on this. I just like to get a book like his, just in black and white, the whole book, whole comic book in black and white. And on, that was page uh, 22 of Fantastic Four, 176 here. I took a lot of influences from directors who had a sense of design and, and dynamics. Directors like John Ford, William Wyler, and Alfred Hitchcock. 
These were men who knew how to tell a story with pictures. I was luckily, lucky for whatever reason, visual storytelling was something that seemed natural for me. Once I started slowing down a bit, I was able to focus on the storytelling more. Although in the early days it seemed like I was an artistic jack of all trades, there wasn't much wasn't as much diversity as you might think. For example, Man Wolf was a bit more science fiction and had some superhero links with characters like Nick Fury. But these books had a lot more ordinary people in their supporting cast, and drawing ordinary people wasn't something I was used to, so I benefited eventually from having to draw ordinary people. Bill Mantlow, for instance, had a very strong social conscience, so he did stories with an urban angle and a social theme. And as a result, he included a lot more normal people in his stories. For every Superman, there has to be a Clark Kent. You can't just draw superheroes all the time. Wow, that's cool. You know what, I'm going to stop right there. Hopefully you enjoyed that. Um, let me know what you think. Um, this is a great book. This is going to be fun doing this. I'm going to try to go through the whole book like this so you can enjoy it. Just real short intervals and everything so you can look at it and get past it. But thank you very much for watching. You guys have a great day and Collect the Dudes out.